everybody. Today is October 5th and you are watching Discern with Jim Dennison. Hi, Jim. Hey, Jess. So glad to be with you today. Jim, in your daily article, you reference a New York Times explainer that uh, really helped unflush this topic. And you said that President Biden ran on a platform of unifying the country, appealing both to moderates and to liberals in his party. Um, it's a, and you said now moderates in Washington support his $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill called the American Jobs Plan, but have serious doubts about his $3.5 trillion American Family Plan. Liberals support both and are afraid that adopting the first will cost them the leverage they need for adopting the second. Both sides claim to be representing and advancing the president's agenda. And so we see partisan bickering and deep divisions within a political party, not just between the parties. So can you talk more about that and what you meant and kind of what's going on in Washington right now? Yeah, the first thing to say is that this is the way the system was intended to work that the founders wanted a system where people would be elected from different communities, cultures, even states. They'd get together in Washington, they would hammer out their differences, there'd be conflict, there'd be compromise, and ultimately what would accomplish the greater good would be the intended result. In your article, you said the phrase, a consensual morality. What mm -hmm. do you mean by that? Yeah, that's what we're missing in the conversation. So the founders, whether they were deists or what we would call evangelical Christians, had a consensual sense of right and wrong, a sense of what the values of the culture ought to be, kind of the north on the compass, as it were, and that's gone now. Now we're living in what's called therapeutic moral deism at best. We're in a culture that it's all about me, authenticity is what I want it to be. And in that kind of a culture, we don't have even the basis for shared commonality, for shared discussion. And that's why what you're seeing in Washington, the kind of divisiveness, the kind of anger, the animosity that we're seeing right there, in many ways reflects the country and the divisiveness, the animosity of the country as well. It's intended chaos, but it's more chaotic than it was intended to be because we've lost the consensual overlap that makes the kind of democracy the founders intended really work, even really possible. And that's a very dangerous place for us as a country to be. I think after reading more about this, what stuck out to me was just like, in my mind, it seems like when the founders founded the country and wrote the constitution and all the things and had this vision for a democracy, it seems like fast forward 200 years, to me, it almost like makes sense that there's so much division and disunity mm -hmm. and that like th those ideals maybe couldn't last. I don't know, I just think there are times when I'm like, okay, that's, it sounds nice to like wanna build a country on shared values and wanna believe that that will be carried through. Um, but I think when I read this, I'm like, oh, the U.S. has just gotten so big and more complex that it almost seems, and what you said of like, now it's, we live in a world where it's kind of just like, how can I be comfortable? What about me? And mm -hmm. it's not so much about, mm -hmm. everyone has their own moral compass, right. I guess. And it, I don't know, I think that's why I tend to, I don't think I could ever be a politician is just because I think it's hard when a bunch of people are coming together trying to create bills and laws when they're each, when they, everyone has a different moral compass or values and like everybody thinks that their values are right. And so, yeah, I think there's, I don't know, there's not really a question there, but I, it's just a thought that I had. Yeah, no, I think that reflects uh, human nature. You know, someone said if two people always agreed, one wouldn't be necessary. If you look at even how the founders built this country, you, you read about the debates that went into the finalizing the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and all that was inside all of that. That sort of conflict is normal and natural. Uh, that kind of conflict happens in marriages. It happens in families, happens in churches, certainly in denominations as well as in political parties, but what they have is a shared north on the compass. What they have is a shared sense of, of, of consensual values, consensual morality, and that's what we're missing in our culture today is that. That's why, as you said just so well, it's really tempting to just kind of pull back, to kind of say, well, maybe the democratic experiment has run its course. Maybe we're now so divided, we're so chaotic, we're so conflicted that democracy won't work. Maybe this is an experiment that's about to be done. I don't believe that. I absolutely believe that America's best days can be in our future, but that's where the church has to step up and has to be the salt and light that God's called us to be and make the difference that really no one else can make. 
So you said the church itself needs to be the salt and the light of the earth. How can we do that? How can we as believers be salt and light? What are some practical ways that that could happen? Right. Jesus in Matthew 5, as you know, in the Sermon on the Mount, said to the church, you're the salt of the earth, you're the light of the world. He didn't say that to Caesar. He didn't say that to the Sanhedrin. He didn't say that to the Pharisees or the Sadducees or the priests. He said that to his followers. When it says you are the salt of the earth. A definite article means there is no other salt but this. There is no other light but this. It's a present tense when he says you are the salt of the earth. Not you could be, you might be, you are. You are it. If there's a dark room and you've got the only flashlight, the darkness is your fault. At the end of the day, you got to turn your light on, right? So how do we do that? Three practical steps, I would suggest. First of all, every believer every single day needs it. This is Ephesians 5.18. Needs to be filled with the Spirit. We start every day by getting alone with God, and we ask the Holy Spirit to take control of us, to empower us, to lead us, to guide us, to use us through that day. Human words can't change human hearts. We can't convict people of sin. We can't save souls. We can't change marriages. We can't change our country. But God can. So we start the day by submitting the Spirit, asking to be empowered by the Spirit. Second, we get alone with the Lord early in the day for worship and Bible study and prayer. Mark 135, Jesus went out a great while before a day and went to a solitary place and prayed. We need to do that. We need an appointment with God every day at the start of the day. You put fuel in the car before you drive it. You warm up before you sing. Ronald Reagan asked one of the Air Force One pilots why they always landed so close to the front of the runway. He said, well, they teach you in flight school, you can't use the runway that's behind you. So you want to give the day to God at the start of the day. You want to get alone with him, make an appointment just to be alone with him. So get submitted to the Spirit, filled with the Spirit. Start the day with the Lord. And then third, ask God to use your influence to make a difference in your culture. God has given you influence. He's given you gifts and abilities and resources. It's where you work. It's where you go to school. It's where your family is. It's this conversation you and I are having. God has given us a kingdom assignment, a, a place where our influence can make a kingdom difference. Ask God to help you to know that influence. Submit that to him. Ask him to use your influence as salt and light, and I promise you he will answer that prayer. Something, just because we're talking about division within a party and you brought mm -hmm. up, there's also divisions within the church, within mm -hmm. Christ's body. And mm -hmm. I, I think after I read this, I was like, man, I think it's important too that people who aren't walking with Jesus or wouldn't identify themselves as a Christian, I think it's important for us as Christians and believers to be modeling um, like mm -hmm. how to argue and be in conflict with one another well and I I need to learn how to do that because I think I can be quick if I feel like I disagree with someone or I see disagreement I get like really tense but I think we need to learn that like mm -hmm. I need to learn that I think is it Ephesians where it says the battle or the fight isn't against flesh and blood mm -hmm. Ephesians uh, 6. and so exactly. I think just remembering that like mm -hmm. it is okay if there is if there is disagreement or tension, but like how we come together and how we speak to one another mm -hmm. too and what the things we say about each other. Um, I don't know, that has really weighed heavily on me is I can, I think internally I can be quick to be like judgy mm -hmm. and want to like get that person back. But rather it's like, okay, how do we talk about this in a way that, mm -hmm. yeah, just is humble and kind and yeah. Those are oh, absolutely. Awesome. I actually wrote a book uh, for the electoral cycle a couple years ago entitled Respectfully, I Disagree. And the whole point of the mm. book was how to recover civility in a day like this. And it's exactly what you're saying. We have to model what we're asking the culture to be. I can't lead people mm -hmm. where I'm not willing to go. I can't give what I don't have. When people see division in the church and chaos and all that, it's really hard to want to go to the church or to let the church be a moral authority in the culture, right? So it's unity, not uniformity. We're not asking that everybody agree on everything at all. Again, if two people agree, one would be necessary. But it's doing this in the spirit of Christ. To me, it goes back to the book of Ephesians chapter 5, where we're told to speak the truth in love. So we speak the truth with each other in the church and to the culture, but we do so in a spirit of humility and love, where beggars helping beggars find bread, where people that are saying, look, I'm just as fallen as you, just as needing of Jesus as you are. Let me share with you what Jesus has done in my life and pray every day, Lord, make me an agent of unity in my church. Make me an agent of unity in my influence. Make me an agent of unity in this world. 
and never underestimate God's ability to use one person to change the world. Don't believe that God can't use you. It takes a little bit of salt to change the flavor of the food, right? If we were in a dark room and I turned on a flashlight, you'd see it instantly. So don't underestimate God's ability to use your life to be that change agent that the culture needs so desperately today. Well, Jim, I've really enjoyed getting to hear your thoughts on this. Um, truthfully, mm -hmm. just topics about government and politics and like bills and things like that, I tend to just like not really know how to like talk about it, but it has been really helpful to get to sit down mm -hmm. with you. And I have no doubt that these topics will continue coming up and I look mm -hmm. forward to when they do. Um, but that's all we have for you guys today. We will see you here tomorrow on Discern. Mm -hmm.